thought, um, just given uh, what we're going to talk about, I'd start off with this shir. Koi virani si virani hai, dash ko dekh ke ghar yaad aaya. So the shir by Ghalib, um, Urdu poetry. And I'm not very, I mean, I'm great at appreciating Urdu poetry, not so great at translating it. But I think the general sense is that on, on encountering a desert, uh, the poet Ghalib says that on, uh, you know, in seeing this desolation, I'm reminded of my home and the emptiness over there. So it seemed appropriate uh, given this novel. Um, Exit West has been called a novel about refugees that feels instantly canonical. It's been called a magical vision of the refugee crisis. Uh, apart from being an honest meditation on love and prejudice, Exit West is one of the pithiest and most powerful comments on the contemporary zeitgeist, says LA Times. Praise for Morsin Hamid's uh, latest works is amazing, but his previous works have similarly garnered critical acclaim. His debut novel, Mod Smoke, was remarkable for giving us a window into contemporary urban Pakistan. Uh, the Reluctant Fundamentalist was noted for its timely exploration of a divided world, as was his self-help self style follow-up, How to Get Filthy Rich in Asia. Mohsin is also a well-known essayist. Uh, if you haven't seen his essays in The Guardian and Time and many others, I would suggest you should check them out. And also a collection of his essays can be found in Discontent and Its Civilizations. Much has been written about the genius of Mohsin Hamid, his precise prose <laughs> that soars above the page. In response, he's known to quote another author, Douglas Adam. Um, we know him from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that flying is learning how to throw yourself on the ground and miss. Mm. So I hope we're ready to leap together, Mohsin. <laughs> Thank you. Mohsin Hamid. So Mohsin, with regards to Exit West, there's been lots of um, commentary, whether it's uh, written reviews or also interviews about how timely Exit West is. You couldn't have known about the, uh, the events that happened, including the travel van, but what do you make of all the analysis that, that your work in fiction is getting in light of the headlines? Um, well, first of all, thank you for that introduction, and, and also thank you to the Toronto Public Library uh, for hosting this event. Um, and thank you to all of you, particularly the three or four of you in the audience who are not actually my cousins. I think <laughs> there's, there's, most of the audience is related to me, but there are one or two I haven't met yet, and so I'm looking forward to seeing you afterwards. Uh, it's not that I predicted current events, but I did feel when I moved from uh, the UK, where I'd lived uh, until about eight or nine years ago, mm -hmm. back to Lahore, where I live now. Uh, when I left the UK, I felt this gathering anti-migrant sentiment and in press and politics, the idea that migrants are the problem, migrants are evil, migrants are criminals. Um, and that rhetoric was growing in other places as well. And when I arrived in Pakistan, what people said to me, you know, uh, after welcome back, was, uh, you've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> you know, uh, you should get the hell out of here. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind would come to Pakistan. We want to leave. Uh, that created a slight sense of you know, discomfort. Uh, have I really made a mistake? Is this really a bad thing to do? But I felt this tension between so many people who want to leave where they are mm. and travel and go to new places, and so many people who want no one new to come. And so the novel was born out of that tension. And, and it just so happens that that tension has now reached a kind of fever pitch mm -hmm. at the moment of publication. Mm -hmm. Well, much has been made, I mean, speaking of leaving, much has been made of these magical doors that, that are there in Exit West. Uh, you know, you do away with the migrant's journey, uh, something that others could have spent thousands of words on. You've credited um, both writers, such as Jorge Luis Borges in the past, also spoken about reading Harry Potter to your kids. Uh, I certainly can relate to wanting to find um, the flu powder uh, when I'm running on Indian Standard Time. But uh, how did the idea of, of these doors uh, come about? Well, so to give a little bit of a context for the doors, mm -hmm. um, so Exit West is a novel that begins in an unnamed city, which is a lot like, a lot like Lahore, Pakistan. And then uh, there's two main characters, Sayyid and Nadia, who meet. And uh, uh, Sayyid 
uh, lives with his parents and uh, is very attached to his family, is somewhat spiritual inclination, and Nadia is someone who's broken with her family, lives on her own, which is very unusual for women in that city. Mm -hmm. um, she uh, is sort of resolutely forward-looking and non-nostalgic, and she also um, is not religious really at all. And these two characters meet and begin a romance just as the city begins to tumble into uh, uh, increasing violence and anarchy and eventually uh, civil war. And, um, and in the world of Exit West, which is a lot like our world, mm -hmm. uh, there's one slight difference, um, which is that these doors begin to appear. So you are perhaps going to your bathroom in your house, and the door to your bathroom overnight has become an opaque black rectangle. And if you were to force yourself through that rectangle, instead of emerging in your bathroom, you would emerge in Toronto, you would emerge from Toronto, you would emerge in Lahore, or mm -hmm. in Delhi, or in Caracas, or in Sao Paulo. And, uh, uh, and that, in a sense, is a magical element, I guess. The rest of the novel obeys the laws of physics, but this one uh, <laughs> little element doesn't. Little time bending. Um, but in some ways, I think these doors already exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in Lahore just a few weeks ago, stepped through a door, found myself in London, then another one in Dublin, another one, you know, it happened to be the door of an aircraft. But you can step through, you can look through your, when you have your Skype open, you're talking to someone far away, you're looking at a window on your computer, they're looking at a window on theirs. It's like you're seeing each other through a window. Or you can take out your mobile phone and be surfing the internet and your consciousness is suddenly in Antarctica or, uh, or Japan. Hmm. So distance has collapsed in a way in our technologically connected world. And the doors are magical in the way they function, but actually very much of the technological reality we live in. And what happens because of the doors is people begin to move. Right. Say that now they are able to leave their city and the sort of holocaust that's unfolding there, or the, or the, co the colossal waste of life which is unfolding there. Um, but uh, uh, other people are able to move to. And, and in the course of the novel, the next two or three centuries of human migration unfold in the space of just a year or two. Mm. And millions, billions of people move and the world is transformed. Um, uh, partly, I wanted to explore that reality. I wanted to explore the uh, migration apocalypse um, and, and examine whether perhaps it won't be apocalyptic at all. Hmm. Um, perhaps it'll be something amazing in some senses. Uh, but also, I wanted to focus on what makes people want to leave and what happens when you arrive in a new place. Because that's something all of us have in common. The, the part where you cross the Rio Grande, uh, you know, paying a people smuggler, or you cross the Mediterranean in a small boat, we think of as that's the refugee experience. That's a few days of the refugee's experience. The rest of their lifetime is not like that. And, and so um, I wanted the reader to recognize the similarity of the stories instead of thinking of the right refugee or the migrant as something very different from themselves. Hmm. But it's interesting also because um, this idea of the journey has been such an important trope so f thus far, you know, from Greek epics, myths around the world, buildings, Romans. Y you wanted to tell the story of before and after. Yeah. Why, why was that important? Well, as you say, it's an important trope for a long time. So in the Odyssey, it's the story of Odysseus trying to get home. Right. Um, and in my novel, the Odyssey is basically shrunk to effectively a paragraph. Yes. And the rest of it is, why did this just leave, you know, leave home in the first place? And what happened when he and Penelope got back together? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, shrinking that part of the story for me was important because the novel explores the fact that every human being migrates. That migration is a universal state that we all participate in. Mm. Um, nobody evolved in North America. Right. Everybody who's here today, your ancestors evolved in Africa at some point, and from there they spread around the world. A um, few centuries ago, nobody of European ancestry lived here. Mm. Uh, so there's that ancestral part of migration. Mm -hmm. But also, even if you were born in Toronto 80 years ago and you've lived here your entire life, uh, you've migrated all the same because the city has completely changed. Mm. The Toronto you're born, you were born in doesn't exist. The school you went to has been paved over, uh, the, uh, the playground has been converted to a parking lot, your friends have moved or dispersed or died, um, your neighbors 
speak different languages, um, the way people dress and behave is foreign. And stepping out of your home today, after 80 years of living in Toronto, there's no doubt that you've migrated in a very substantial way, even though you've stayed here the whole time. And so the novel is really about that, about, about the, the nature of the human journey, um, both across generations and in each of our individual lives, uh, and how that, that sense of journey is much more profound and all-encompassing than simply moving from one place to another. Hmm. It's interesting because at the same time, it's become such such a sort of bone of contention at the moment. We can't seem to go beyond that kind of association. I mean, you're, you're looking to a sort of very humanist, kind of very, you know, greater humanity, very rational approach. No, it's actually an emotional approach because, hmm. you know, so um, say that Nadia leave their hometown and they first go to Greece and then they go to London and eventually they wind up in Marin County opposite yes. uh, uh, San Francisco. <laughs> Um, and in each of these places, they have these different experiences. And there's a lot of nativist sentiment, people who are very resentful and frightened of migrants. Understandably so. Mm. Uh, but I would argue that, uh, you know, that fear of migrants is a bit like fear of somebody of a different race. It's understandable, but it's not something which necessarily we should think we should feel entirely comfortable about. Mm. Um, so whatever one's own racist inclinations are, uh, it's best to try to grapple with them and overcome them, mm. even though it's a natural thing for people to feel. Right. Um, so, so I think that uh, people have always moved. The nation state is the new thing. Mm. We are suddenly imposing upon people the idea that they can't move. But in two or three or four hundred years, people will look back at this moment in human history and they will think it's as strange that we believe that the place you were born fundamentally defines the rights you have as a human being. Mm. They'll think that's just as strange as we think of people 200 years ago who kept slaves because they were you know, uh, of a different race mm. in, you know, in America, for example. Mm. Uh, the, now, the idea of discrimination on your race or your gender or your sexual orientation or your religious belief or your, uh, uh, you know, your speech strikes us as uh, kind of barbaric and backward. And yet, if someone happens to be born in Mogadishu as opposed to in Toronto, we think it's entirely sensible they should have completely different rights. Um, I don't think that position will be sustained. I think eventually, not too long in the future, but maybe it'll take centuries, people will say this is preposterous. Why is being born in a place going to determine the rights of the human being to such an extent? Mm. And so um, I don't think that's a rational argument necessarily. I think it's actually very significantly an emotional argument. Mm. Like, do you really feel that this child born in Mogadishu and your child born in Toronto are not equal as human beings? Mm. Um, is that really something that you in your heart think is true? Uh, so so the, the novel, in a way, tries to in the course of, say, the Nadia story and how they move and their love affair, how it evolves and changes, um, tries to explore that emotional register. You, do you, the reader, um, feel sympathy for them? Can you imagine their life being like your life? Uh, and if you do, um, then that's an emotional argument to, to rethink how we think of migrants, uh, not necessarily a rational one. Hmm. Now, you, this is not the first time you have dealt with the experience of a migrant. Even in your debut novel, Motsmo, there is Aung Zee Razi who returns from America. Um, and Montaz. And Montaz. Yeah. Uh, informed by your experiences, um, you know, you've spoken about your, uh, your own journeys from Pakistan to California when you were a child, back to Pakistan, back to America, then to England. Um, how has this informed all of your writing? I think it sort of gave you that first impulse to be a writer in the first place. Yeah, well, um, so I spent, uh, I went to California when I was three years old. And, uh, and then to, was... my father was doing his PhD uh, at Stanford. He's a university professor. And so at the age of three, I moved to California. I didn't speak a word of English. And uh, one day my mother heard crying outside the house where we lived. And we lived in these identical townhouses on the Stanford University campus, uh, Escondido Village. And she stepped outside and she saw that I was in the next house, you know, <laughs> looking up at this neighbor who was looking down at me. Uh, he was perplexed. I was thinking, you're not my mother. And anyway, uh, and I was surrounded by a bunch of kids. And 
as is the case with you know graduate students on any North American campus, these kids are from all over the world. You know, Canada, Israel, India, Japan, America. Uh, a UN of kids. Yes. Uh, and they asked my mother, what's wrong with him? Uh, and she said, what do you mean? And they said, well, why can't he speak? And they said, you know, he, he can speak, he just can't speak English. And after that, and I started speaking very young, and after that, I uh, went home with my mom, and uh, my parents say that for one month I didn't speak at all. And they were very worried. My mother said, we should take him to a doctor. My father said he'll probably be okay. And I just watched TV, and I didn't talk. And a month later, when I began to speak, I spoke in full sentences, but I spoke English with an American accent. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> and it wasn't until six years later that I moved back to Pakistan that my parents discovered I'd completely forgotten my Urdu. And I had to relearn Urdu, my first language, um, as a third language, really, because English was my second, and my original Urdu was lost. And so <laughs> Urdu became my third language at the age of nine. And I lived in Lahore till 18, went back to America, and then to London, and then to Pakistan again. And for a long time when I was a kid, I thought, you know, I should just fit in. Mm -hmm. I should, in America, come across as an American kid, in Pakistan, come across as a Pakistani kid, because young kids always want to, or not always, but so often we want to not be different. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just an instinctive uh, uh, feeling in, in children in particular, certainly in me. But as I got older, I realized that uh, uh, I didn't need to necessarily try to be like whoever I was with. Mm -hmm. um, I was probably more comfortable just being a sort of mongrelized, hybridized, you know, foreignish, weird uh, thing. And once I began to accept this, that I'm not fully Pakistani, I'm not fully American, I'm certainly not fully British, um, uh, I'm you know, sort of semi-foreign everywhere, I realized that everybody feels foreign, actually. That uh, uh, some people feel foreign because they've lived in different places. Somebody else feels foreign because they're the only gay person in their family, or they're the only uh, conservative person in a liberal family, or they're the only artist in a group of friends who are all very pra you know, pragmatic, or um, they're the only person who suffers from depression in a community where everybody else seems so upbeat. And, and this notion of foreignness being central and essential to what human beings are, in a weird way, made me think that actually I'm kind of like everyone. Mm. Uh, you know, when you embrace your inner weirdo, you uh, yes. you realize that everybody has an inner weirdo, and um, and that was an enormous uh, kind of liberation, and also uh, something that deeply informed my writing ever since. Um, and has been borne out by the many readers I've met. People say, you know, what does a Pakistani audience think of your work? And I say, there's no such thing. There's just different people in Pakistan, each of whom read my books differently. Just as there are different people in Canada. If we ask 10 people in this row what they make of one of my books, they'll have 10 very different answers. Um, and so, yeah, I've been profoundly shaped by the experience of migration. And, uh, but rather than thinking that it makes me into something quite strange, it makes, makes me think that it's, it allows me to recognize something that's actually in common. And, and so in this novel in particular, I wanted to explore um, the notion that migration is not something that defines some human beings, but it's something that defines the human being full stop. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you also, as a child, used to... Um, atlases were a huge fa yeah. source of fascination for yeah. you. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, when I was a kid, I used to you know, play with atlases and uh, map out imaginary countries and write all these sort of you know, uh, uh, imaginary worlds. And, um, and in a sense, I was... Uh, San Francisco, Lahore. Yeah, sort of, of you know, things like that. And, I, and in a sense, it was, um, you know, uh, one, a very odd behavior for anyone to engage in. So I marked myself early as a bit, you know, a bit of a strange egg. But also, it was you know, the proto-novelist in me expressing himself. Mm -hmm. um, coming up with these imaginary countries and these imaginary worlds as a child uh, was, was, um, was, in a way, continuing to play in a world of make-believe, mm -hmm. which is what I do for a living now. And, uh, and my kids do it. So my son is four, my daughter is seven. And you know, at the drop of a hat, my four-year-old son will become a T-Rex. You know, he he suddenly he's a you know, little boy, and then 
instantaneously for some reason or known only to him. His elbows tuck to his side. He sort of crouches. He begins to stomp. He makes a blood-curdling roar. And he starts walking around, pacing the house, you know, as a very dangerous uh, T-Rex. And uh, he just does this. Uh, and my daughter, you know, she's a complete fantasist. And she, they used to call her Power Dina in school because she told everybody she had superpowers. And she ah. convinced other girls in her class they all had superpowers. And, and you know, she would go to school. Uh, uh, this, this very literal friend of ours met Dina uh, in London, this other friend of mine's daughter. And she said to my friend, her mother, she said after Dina left, she said, but mama, she's just a liar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, uh, but which is understandable. <laughs> like she doesn't have superpowers. It's like this is, these are all lies. Oh, um, but but kids have a basic need to live in an imaginary make-believe world, and that need doesn't actually go away. It stays with us our entire lives, and that's partly why we read fiction. Mm. You know, when you read a novel as an adult, that is the way that adults play make-believe. We enter into this world, our imagination creates it because we're looking only at words on a page, but we're not experiencing words on a page. We're experiencing people and things that we see and feelings and sounds. Um, and all of that is coming from ourselves. And, uh, and so entering into that make-believe experience is, is fundamental to um, you know, what being a reader is and also what being a writer is. And it's something that I spent a lot of my childhood doing. You wrote this um, essay in The Guardian about, the, was it after the birth of your first child that you felt this incredible need to go back to Lahore? What, what was that? Well, it was, um, uh, I think like many people, I thought, you know, one day I will go back to Lahore. Um, and I had moved away in around the time I was 18, and I'd gone back for a year here or there, but uh, 20 years had basically passed. And I hadn't really moved back. And I thought, you know, if I don't move back now, I might never move back. I might be convinced that Pakistan is too dangerous or uh, Dina will start going to school and she will become, she'll have friends and be settled and it'll be hard to uproot her. And so, um, and so I talked to my wife and we, uh, we agreed that we'd try it. And not necessarily as a permanent thing. You move and if you don't like it, you can leave again. But... Um, We'd rather try it then than spend our whole lives wondering what if. Mm. Uh, and so we moved back. Mm. But Lahore changed, I mean, as, as the city does. And, yeah. you know, you've spoken about how um, there is a certain anxiousness that has come within your person. What, what was well, I mean, you know, Lahore, when I was growing up in the 1980s, had uh, a very bizarre, you know, political environment. We had this... Uh, uh, pretty crazy uh, dictator, Ziaul Haq, and he had this mission to Islamize Pakistan, in quotes, Islamize, which is was an absurd mission because Pakistan is, you know, 90-something percent Muslim anyway. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but it was really a kind of political ideology based on, you know, uh, uh, his, his notion of what Islam was. And, um, and it had a profound impacts on the society. And so the Lahore I grew up in the 80s was a place of, decreasing political space and, 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 uh, and decreasing creative space. And, but it was also pretty safe. Uh, Lahore today is a place where, in a sense, there's much more interesting cultural, social, artistic things going on. The political environment is, is much more open than it was in the 1980s. Uh, but the sense of safety has diminished. And, uh, you know, that there have been uh, many decades of, of the Pakistani state uh, actively permitting, you know, uh, violent extremists to organize in Pakistan for various purposes and uh, leaving aside the many involvements by other countries in Pakistan, which have also been very significant. But, but certainly the Pakistani state is, is in my mind, uh, responsible for uh, really a very bad uh, decision, which we're living with the consequences of today, which is um, you know, that there are these groups of people who uh, can lash out violently against people they don't like. And so living in, in Pakistan comes with that, um, uh, that sense of anxiety. Mm -hmm. But that said, nowhere is perfectly safe. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not that Lahore, even if you count terrorism, Lahore's homicide rate per capita probably is less than Chicago's. Um, so, so it's, it's, you know, I, I say that sometimes it's like, it's like being a surfer in California. 
Mm. You know, sometimes somebody is chomped by a great white shark. <laughs> it can happen. Um, and yet people go out and surf every single day. And Lahore's are like that in a way. If you watch Jaws, you'll never surf because you think, oh my goodness. <laughs> if you watch the news, you'll think, I can never go to Lahore because Lahore is this terrifyingly violent and, and hor horrible place. Um, but Lahore isn't really a terrifyingly violent and horrible place, but it does have some serious problems, obviously, like all big cities. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, the arts and culture we're talking about. You, you've, you've talked about before in, in another interview how there seems to be many more novelists these days, young people coming up to you and talking to you, whereas, you know, you grew up and novels weren't quite the thing. What's, what's ascribe, what would you ascribe this change to? Well, uh, there are more people and there are more students. I mean, you know, Lahore today has two or three hundred thousand university students, uh, probably as many as Toronto or Boston. And that's quite incredible when you think that Pakistan in the first 50 years since independence produced a total of a million university graduates mm. uh, across all the universities over 50 years. Now Pakistan produces a million university graduates every year. And um, that's a huge difference. Um, many, many more young people are studying more. And along the way, many of them are reading, and in particular, many of them read in English because they recognize most of these kids don't speak Urdu at home. Mm. They learn Urdu in school and uh, in primary school. Then they get to secondary school and they're told, no, no, the Urdu you know isn't actually Urdu. You have to learn proper Urdu. And they relearn it and they learn a bit of English. And they come to college at Punjab University or some university in Lahore. And they're told, actually, you don't speak English at all. The thing you speak is just, you know, it's a mess. You have to learn English properly. And they learn it again. And so they, they learn language after language, layer after layer, and they go through these hoops, which I think is, is slightly insane. I mean, I, I think they should probably be taught in whatever language they speak at home, and later they can pick up other stuff. But there are historical reasons for the way it is. That said, there are so many young people in university in Pakistan today who are first-generation English speakers who are reading in part because they want to be part of the English language world. And because there is no you know, single native language of Pakistan, only 10% speak Urdu at home, really. Uh, so in this world of young people going to university and encountering books, what you see is so many young people are reading uh, novels by Pakistani writers in English. Um, uh, you know, certainly for me, uh, the place I'm most likely to encounter a reader of my work is Pakistan. Um, if I go to a bookshop or a restaurant or whatever, uh, a university campus, I'll meet many young people who will have read my work. And it's similar, I think, for other Pakistani writers, too. Uh, uh, you know, at the Lahore Literary Festival, there'll be s school teachers and university teachers from Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and even the tribal areas who will come in and they'll say, look, I teach your work and wow. can you record a little video for my students or will, can, can I bring my students? And, uh, and they'll tell me about the conversations they have. And, and, um, and so it's a very interesting moment for English language fiction writing in Pakistan hmm. um, because it's a very interesting moment for English language reading in Pakistan. Uh, these young people recognize that the English language is their ticket to better economic opportunity. If you want to work in Dubai or Toronto, you better speak English. But in Pakistan, the constitution is written in English. Business contracts are largely in English. Um, Without English, you are of a lower uh, economic, uh, uh, socioeconomic status. And, and then they begin to read these books. And I think many of them discover, this is interesting. And there's a kind of countercultural role that the novel plays. Um, young people are reading about you know, politics or sexuality or um, all sorts of different things. And, and because many of these books are set in Pakistan or familiar settings, they, they find them interesting. And, and then I think many of those young people say, well, I can do this. And so uh, at every Lahore Literary Festival, I probably meet 30 or 40 or 50 young people in the space of two or three days who tell me about the novels they're working on. And uh, uh, that is, I think, an amazing, amazing thing. And of course, alongside the Urdu long, uh, novel and the Punjabi novel and all the other languages are continuing to uh, function. But I think there's something particularly interesting about the English language reading and writing culture emerging in Pakistan. Um, because on university campuses, uh, generally speaking, uh, it seems to me that that's, that's, the, that's what's being read the most.
Is there a tension between um, the languages in English and, uh, sorry, the novels in English and um, uh, those written in Urdu, Punjabi, or, or other languages, in the sense that I read one author who sort of said that, you know, um, the Urdu language novels have always addressed the concerns of the everyday people. We don't necessarily write war and terror books. Mm. Um, is there, have you encountered that kind of attention? You know, uh, it, it's interesting because um, I think when one starts to generalize in this way, you wind up in very tricky terrain. Mm. Um, so for many people, everyday people, the war on terror is an everyday concern. So if you happen to live in Waziristan, you know, what's your everyday concern? You've been displaced. You mm. can't go home. Um, if you live in Karachi and you're a Shia uh, who's subjected to random violence and the fear of you know, uh, sectarian killing, um, your everyday life isn't just that you like football. It is also that. Uh, so um, I don't think necessarily that one can say that, oh, you know, uh, uh, English language novels deal with these subjects and Urdu or uh, Punjabi novels deal with different subjects. Um, and of course, you have many English language novels which don't deal with those subjects. Uh, I think it's more about individual novelists and individual writers. People have different concerns as individuals. Uh, so, um, uh, but certainly, you know, it is true that if you write in English, your work is accessible to a global readership. Um, and that brings with it its own uh, complications. People, you know, uh, think, oh, well, you know, you're, you're selling out and you're sort of trying to, you know, um, make money or uh, build a career on the back of, you know, uh, taking pox and exporting it to the world. Um, I think people like that have a very uh, uh, overinflated imagination of how much novelists actually make. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I think most people who are novelists, uh, who, for example, studied abroad, could very easily have another job that pays much more than writing novels. But that said, it isn't wrong to ask that question. Mm. You know, to what extent are we compromised by the notion of a global market? To what extent does one subconsciously write for that market? Mm. It's a very difficult thing to answer as a writer. Um, and it's, it's a, a valid a, a point of critique, I think, to bring to a writer and to say, look, um, this is possibly going on. And as a writer, you have to think, how do I counter that? So for me, for example, in How to Get Filtration from Rising Asia, I don't use the word Pakistan once. Hmm. I don't use the word Islam once. There's no names in that book. Because I didn't want to be representing Pakistan to the world or representing Islam to the world. I thought, I'm just going to write about this unnamed city full of unnamed characters with unnamed religions and describe what their lives are actually like, not use pre-existing understandings of, oh, the word Pakistan means this, the word Islam means this, the word Lahore means this. Instead, just describe things um, and, and aim in a way to say that, look, I'm writing from my experience, and I will claim that my experience is just as central as the experience of somebody living in Toronto or New York or London. It's not exotic or some strange thing. In many ways, living in Lahore is more typical of what it is like to live in a big city on planet Earth in the beginning of 21st century than living in Toronto is. Toronto is less like most of the big cities in the world than perhaps Lahore is. Hmm. And so each writer, I think, has to come up with their own means of addressing the tendency towards self-exoticization, um, or not. It's up to them. Right. But, but I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think, I think that the notion that uh, you know, English language writers as a whole uh, do this, and Urdu language writers as a whole do something else, is to, is to make writing into a team sport when it really is a solitary activity. So speaking of uh, solitary activities, um, another remark often made about your novels is how precise they are, how concise they are. Um, how do you approach the idea of structure in your novels? It's, it's very important. I mean, it's... I mean, I try to write small books. <laughs> uh, most of my friends and family and cousins in Lahore, you know, uh, don't read much literature. And so in my mind, I think, you know, what's a book that they'll read? Um, and so that comes down to saying, you know, I'd like to write a small book because it's less uh, uh, intimidating. I also want to write a book that has a story. You know, like this novel, Exit West, is at its heart a love story. Mm -hmm. It's a particular kind of love story. It's a love story between two young people who meet and who are both changing very rapidly. Say this changing, Nadia's changing. Initially, they are in, it's difficult for them to meet because there's this 
growing violence in their city. And so their love affair has that emotional charge that every love affair acquires when it's difficult to meet, you know, Romeo and Juliet. Um, uh, uh, you know, if I, if I can't be with you, oh my goodness, I want to be with you so badly. But when I'm stuck in a tent with you in a refugee camp for like months and months and months, all I want is to get the hell away from you. You know, if, if Romeo and Juliet moved into a small, you know, <laughs> studio apartment together, and, uh, and we're both on the dole, and you know, <laughs> couldn't get out of the house, and you know, they'd be saying, you know, "I can't stand your toothpaste, and you know, uh, your shoes smell." Um, it, when we are forced together, we we want to hold ourselves back, mm. and when we are pulled apart, we're willing to give much more. You know, so what Khalil Gibran says about couples is he says that, you know, that, that uh, uh, drink from each other's cup, but not from the same cup, huh. uh, which is live your life and then partake with each other, but don't try to live one life together because um, it doesn't give either of you space to be who you are. And so in this novel, it's about two young people who are changing very rapidly. And many of us will have experienced something like this, a first love where two people meet, they're young, they're both changing very rapidly, and, and it's difficult, therefore, to sustain the love that they have. Um, uh, it requires constantly re-examining the other person and, and getting to know them afresh again and again and again. But so often we begin to fix people in our imagination, that you are the same person I fell in love with last year. Mm. Um, I can't see who you are today. And because I don't want to see who you are today, I'm in love, in a sense, with a dream in my own mind. And that's what's happening to these characters. And as far as my novels are concerned, it's that core story element, which is the heart of the book. Um, so short novel with, at, the, at its heart, a story. And then in terms of how the structure flows from that, um, I have a very architectural approach to structure, I think, in terms of you know, how does this thing get built? Um, in Moth Smoke, it was a, a, a trial where you, the reader, are the judge and the other characters come and tell their stories to you. It's kind of a surreal trial. In Latin Fundamentalist, it's a conversation between a Pakistani and presumably an American that he meets in a bazaar in Lahore. And over the course of an evening, they speak, but you only hear the Pakistani's point of view. In How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, it's a self-help book, ostensibly about how to get filthy rich in Rising Asia, but actually you, who are getting filthy rich in Rising Asia, are also you, the reader, and your story is something quite different. Um, and this book is, um, is a story of, of, say, the Nadia set against the backdrop of this world where migration becomes uh, so, uh, so possible for everyone. And, and so this, these kind of different formal approaches unlocks um, different structural solutions. In the first three books, in a way, there was this frame. Mm -hmm. You know, Chenge is speaking to an unnamed American. You, the reader, as a judge of, of Dara and Mumtaz and Aurangzeb's story. Or, um, you, the reader of a self-help book, encountering the story of the you, the character of the self-help book. And each of those frames was slightly at odds with the story inside it. Mm. And, so, and so there's a tension between the two. In the Latin Fundamentalist, you never hear what the American has to say. And also, why would the American sit there and listen to this other guy talking for hours and hours? He probably wouldn't. Um, there's a basic mismatch. And that tension creates an interpretive space, a destabilized space, where the reader has to figure out what the book is. Like, what does it mean to you? What do you think the American is saying? What do you think is going on here? And in that process, the reader creates their own version of the book. But this book is a little bit different, although I think, again, the reader creates their own version. But this book works differently because it doesn't have a frame narrative. There isn't Exit West is being told to you from inside, you know, a treatise on the future of migration or a trial where, say, the Nadia being hauled up in front of an immigration judge. It's just a straight up story. And partly it's because I have kids now and I read them a lot of children's books and I've remembered in a way how powerful children's books were. You know, mm -hmm. if I had never read Charlotte's Web, I might not be a writer. But if I'd never read Lolita or Anna Karenina, I'd still be a novelist. Um, but those books from your childhood that, that make you think, wow, uh, and make you fall in love with reading. Those are the foundational texts in a way of your life. And so I was thinking, you know, how do children's books work? And, and I think that I felt that they work in, in two interesting ways that I tried to use in this book. Um, I think children's books have a kind of double partisan narrator. And what I mean by that is that the narrator in children's book is often on the sides of the character. So when, the, when Charlotte and Wilbur are trying to save Wilbur's life, Wilbur the pig and Charlotte the web and Charlotte's web, 
We're cheering for Charlotte and Wilbur. We don't want Wilbur to die or Charlotte to die. The book is saying, you know, come on, Charlotte, come on, Wilbur. In adult novels, very often the position is, you know, if Anna Karenina isn't happy, she can go throw herself under a train. <laughs> Tough luck, Anna. Uh, the, the narrator isn't, isn't sort of, you know, screaming, like, Anna, please live. The narrator is neutral. Um, so children's book narrators are, are on the side of the characters, but they're also on the side of the reader. Mm -hmm. Children's book narrators very often are like, you know, you and I are cheering for Wilbur. Like, you, the reader, and me, the narrator, are cheering for Wilbur and Charlotte. Like, you know, whereas in adult books, it's, you know, figure it out, pal, if you can. You know, uh, uh, encounter my, you know, geniosity. And, uh, I mean, that's unfair, but, but, um, but certainly very often in, in, in literary fiction intended for adults, um, there's an there's a intentional unreliability in the narration, mm -hmm. um, which is a way of being honest, because it's saying, look, nobody's reliable. I will also be unreliable, but I'll tell you I'm unreliable. And that's more honest than the politicians who tell you that they're not unreliable, but actually are. <laughs> but in children's books, they just tell you what they mean. And so I tried to write this book like that. I tried to say for the first time, I'm going to write a novel which says what it means. In a sense, it's on the side of the reader. There's no, you've got to guess what I'm trying to say. You may agree or disagree. You might imagine it in a different way. But the novel is saying what it intends to say. And, and in that sense, it's like a children's book for adults. And it's a bit different from my previous books. Mm. And I understand this was the one that took you the shortest? Yes. Know? So it's a win-win, it's really. 